else if they will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee. <laughs> And upon thy servants and upon thy people and unto the houses and to the house of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies. And also the ground, verse 12, and I will uh, sever in the day of the land in Goshen, which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end. Thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and the people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh. And into his servants' houses. Into all the land of Egypt. And the land was corrupt by the treason of the swarms. Treason of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron. And said, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, it is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? Will they not stone us? We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go and ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. Ye shall not go very far away. Father, we thank you for your precious word this morning. We ask a blessing. We ask that your anointing be with us, that you will guide us, that you would speak to us, that you will lead us in the paths of righteousness, that you would draw us to your presence and give us fresh manna from heaven, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's make a deal, says the devil. As we begin this morning, I need to paint you a picture in history, especially in the Old Testament, we notice that there were many things that happened where people received bad advice, where there were different voices and opinions. But here in the text, we notice that the king of heaven through Moses is competing with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who is the devil's agent. And the issue at hand here are the people of God, their deliverance or their slavery. And in the process of this confrontation, some bad advice was given. The devil is always trying to give bad advice, to discourage, to hinder, to destroy the move of God or the purposes of God. There are many voices in this world. Uh, many voices... In our workplace, in our schools, in society, many different voices from different people, all trying to get your ear. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And so I need to ask a question, which voice are you listening to this morning? In the Old Testament, as I mentioned, there were several examples of bad advice. For instance, King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was advised by his counselors to increase the taxes and to tax the people. And as they increased the taxes, the people rebelled. But that didn't bother King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam decided to increase the tax. And that caused a major division within Israel. And it caused a split ultimately within the camp. He listened to bad advice. In 1 Kings 22, false prophets gave bad advice to King Jehoshaphat of Judah. King Ahab was in a battle with another king of Syria. And King Ahab asked if King Jehoshaphat would join him together in, uh, in agreement to fight against King Syria of Syria. And Jehoshaphat knew better that he should not make 
this agreement with the king Ahab of Israel. In fact, Micah the prophet told Jehoshaphat, don't align yourself with this king. But he refused to listen to him. And as a result of his disobedience, as a result of listening to the voice of another man rather than the voice of God, he almost died, but King Ahab died as they went into battle. People are listening to all kinds of advice. People would rather listen to the advice of man than the advice of God. We see this everywhere. The devil is always giving bad advice. The devil told Jonah to run away to go to Tarshish, the very opposite of where God wanted him to go. And Jonah listened to the voice of the devil. Jonah listened to the voice of the flesh. Jonah listened to the voice of human reasoning. He hated the Ninevites, and so he wanted to go far away from them. He didn't listen to God's voice. How many people are not listening to God's voice because of the flesh? How many people are not listening to God's voice? Remember, Jonah was a prophet. Don't think that it's people who are not saved or in the world that are rejecting or not listening to the voice of God. You can be a true believer and you cannot be listening to what the Lord is telling you. The devil is always giving bad advice. He told Peter... Peter, to tell Jesus to avoid the cross. Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. And Jesus knew what was behind those apparently innocent words. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Rebuked the devil and said, get thee behind me. The devil wanted to use Peter and his voice to distract, distract what Jesus was going to do when he was supposed to go to Jerusalem. Peter advised him not to go, not to go to the cross. It's always these voices that sometimes these voices come to us and they're not from what you might even think are the ungodly. The devil will try to use anyone to give you bad advice. And he's doing that today. The devil will come to you and tell you and advise you to delay your spiritual growth. The enemy will come and tell you, stop reading the word of God. The enemy will come and tell you, oh, you don't need to pray today. Your mother's praying for you. The church is praying for you. You don't have to pray. You don't have to seek God. It's just the word of God. It's all right. You can delay that. You can read it some other time. The enemy will come to you and tell you, you don't have to go to church today. Just look outside. There's a thunderstorm. It's raining outside. You don't have to go to church. It's too cold. You can stay right home and have church in your home. I can just put on the TV and I can have church. Oh, the devil will always tell you these things. He'll tell you not to give to God. The church has got enough. He'll give you all kinds of advice. And sometimes the advice sounds really good. If you don't have discerning ears. This morning I was in prayer and I woke, I, I prayer walk and I was out very early in the morning and it was raining and I, and I saw dark ominous crowds and, clouds and I said to myself, you know, if this continues, I'm not so sure how many will come to church. Why? Because years of being a pastor have told me that when it's, inclement outside and the weather isn't very good people like to stay home now of course this never happens here at Logos I understand that I understand that but you know what's amazing about all this is that as I saw the dark ominous crowd clouds and even some 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 thundering in the background I noticed people were playing soccer yes because I don't just pray for 10 minutes I was walk, praying for quite a while and so by about 7 o'clock 7.30 there are people playing soccer outside and it's kind of spitting. I saw people jogging down the streets. Oh yeah, I saw cyclists riding their bikes. I saw all kind of people, Ellen. Yes, the rain and the thunder clouds. I saw people playing soccer. I saw people cycling and I saw people jogging. You see, the weather didn't bother them from doing what they like to do. Why does the weather bother us? And furthermore, they don't have a nice roof over their head that can stop the rain from coming. You do. And yet how many times do we stay home because the weather isn't nice? Oh, thank you for that one brave soul that said a lot. 
But isn't it strange that what we love to do, we do whether it's raining or sunny? Isn't that interesting? Why is the church so full of excuses all the time? Why is it we listen to the advice of the enemy that tells us, stay in bed, it's too cold outside, it's raining outside, don't come, don't, don't bother you. The, the enemy, he'll always give you bad advice, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. He'll always come and try to delay your spiritual progress. And so when it's hot and you feel like staying home, you don't want to go to prayer meeting. you rather watch television. I understand that. I'm also made out of flesh. But the enemy will do whatever he can to hinder your spiritual progress. And he's giving bad advice. And in our text, we see a series of bad advices and suggestions that are given by Pharaoh to Moses. Moses is set on the deliverance of God's people from slavery. And of course, Pharaoh is opposed. The devil wants to keep you enslaved. The devil does not want to have you be released from any kind of, of uh, oppression or any kind of bondage. He wants to keep you in chains. And so now... Now that Pharaoh might learn that obedience to God is wise, God has to demonstrate the uselessness and helplessness of all these gods that Pharaoh worships. And he'll do that in your life and in my life. You see, Pharaoh depends and worships the apis bull. He worships the sun god. He worships the river Nile. He worships all these, these creatures, the frog god. And finally, he even worships himself and the Egyptian lineage of Pharaoh, just like the Roman emperors did in Rome hundreds and hundreds of years later. Now, friends, if you're trusting in any other god except the god of heaven and earth, your god is going to let you down. If you're depending on these worldly prosperity gods and these gods of, 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 of secular humanism, they're going to let you down. But God will never let you down. His arms are wrapped around, as the mountains are wrapped and round about Jerusalem, so is the Lord round about his people. Yes, if you're depending on any other God but the God of heaven, your God is going to let you down. That's why Micah said in the seventh chapter, it says, Put not your confidence in a guide. Put not your confidence in a guide or in a man, but put your confidence in the Lord God. Where are you placing your confidence? Who are you placing your confidence in? The name of the Lord is a mighty tower, and the righteous runneth unto it and are safe. And so, my friends, Pharaoh depends on these gods for security. He depends on these gods for satisfaction. So the God of heaven has to demonstrate to Pharaoh that these things which he trusts in are not worthy of his confidence. Now only if Pharaoh can be shown, if he can be shown, that these things cannot really help him. Oh, if he can only be shown, then surely Pharaoh will turn to God, won't he? You think that, that any intelligent person would do so if he would turn to the true source, if somehow it can be shown and proven that these gods that you depend on are not really able to do that, then surely you will turn and trust in the Lord, won't you? You'd think that that would happen. You, you'd think that any intelligent person would turn their hearts to the true and living God if somehow they can see that there's a difference. Uh, yes, you would think so, but there's two problems. Number one, there's the problem of the human heart. Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are wicked and desperately wicked, not just wicked, and that our hearts can deceive us if we're not careful. Well, I will follow my heart, says someone. Well, maybe, but your heart can be called wicked, you know. You can't depend on your own heart. Your heart can deceive you sometimes. Your emotions can deceive you. Your emotions, your heart, they, they tell you one thing, the next day they'll tell you something else. You can't trust in your emotions and your heart. Your heart, th that's great. We want to have the issues of life come from your heart. I understand all that. But Jeremiah says you can't trust in your heart. 
So we have the matter of, of our own stubbornness, our flesh. And then we have the problem with the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world, G-O-D, small g, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. And Satan comes and appears as an angel of light, giving advice, giving direction. We have to be careful because there's also deception out there that is very strong, that can deceive you, that can cause you to believe a lie. And he's very good at that. He'll make you believe a lie. You have your own heart that sometimes is stubborn and you can't always depend on that. You have the God of this world that's trying to deceive you. And there's all kinds of voices that will try to bring us on a wrong path. And that's why it's so important that we have the spirit of discernment. Corinthians tells us in the 12th chapter that one of the operations of the gifts of the spirit is that of discernment. Gives us the ability to discern, is this of God or is this not of God? And we need this today in this generation because we're living in a generation where there's much falsehood and deception and things look very good on the outside, but God knows what's really on the inside and we need to be careful what voice we are listening to. Jesus said in the last days there'll be many false Religions and prophets and voices. And so what is the spirit of the Lord saying to you and to me today? Pharaoh worships the sun god Ra. And so what does God do? God darkens the sun in the middle of the day. It's pitch black. It's dark. And it's only 12 o'clock in the afternoon. What is God saying? Pharaoh! Pharaoh! Your God is not worthy of your worship and of your confidence. I can take the sun and darken it at my will. Pharaoh worships the Nile River. And what does God do? He caused blood-like redness to flow through the Nile River that now you can't drink the water anymore and it begins to stink the Bible says what is God saying Pharaoh you can't trust in the Nile River you can't trust in the sun God in the the Nile River God Pharaoh you're going about it the wrong way. This vast water supply is now useless. Pharaoh, your God is not worthy of your confidence. Pharaoh worships the apis bull, which is a picture of strength and power. So what does God do? He sends a mighty plague of flies to come upon the animals. Devastation runs rampant. This bull that they worship now is full of disease and is weakened. Can hardly walk anymore. Pharaoh! Your God is not worthy of your confidence. I can bring it down. There's no strength in the apis bull, Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you're worshiping the wrong God. And then Pharaoh worships the frog God. So God sends a sea of frogs everywhere. Homes, streets, chariots, crops. Until they become horrible nuisance. And you can't tolerate and they become a disgust and becomes a, they look at these frogs and it becomes a, a, a reproach to them. Pharaoh, your God is not worthy of your confidence. What gods are we serving today? Oh, I know that we don't have these type of gods today. I understand all that. God saying to Pharaoh, you're not God. You see, Pharaoh worships himself. <laughs> he worships his lineage. He worships the line of Pharaohs from past generations. Some are having the audacity of believing that there's deity within their blood. That these are gods, demigods. Pharaoh worships himself. He worships Pharaoh, the concept of Pharaoh, the lineage of Pharaoh. So what does God do? He sends a plague to destroy the firstborn, his son. And this in his son would continue the deity of himself. Pharaoh! You don't, no, there's, no, there's no power in you, Pharaoh. You're dying. Your children are dying. 
dying. Your God has failed you. There's only one God that has life and his name is Jesus for I am the resurrection and the life. You're serving the wrong God, Pharaoh. You're trusting in the wrong God. Now, as I've mentioned, I know that we don't serve these gods today. I understand that. We serve other kind of gods, North American gods like money and mammon and human technology and military armament and pleasures and sports and entertainments. We serve other gods. Oh, they're not as blatant in your face, but they're, they're uglier. And you can hear the hissing of the serpent behind every one of these gods because they're so subtle. And some of these gods are in the church. Oh, Pastor Dino, now you're really... No, it's the absolute truth. What is a God? A God is something we value more than God. A God is someone or something we lift up higher than God. What is... It's, it's something or someone we give more time to. Something we love higher than God has become a God has become an obsession, has become a mindset, a, a need, a desire. And so man has elevated himself and he has become God as well, just like Pharaoh. How do I know that? Just look how we live today. Our generation today is so self-absorbed. It's all about me, myself, and I. And one by one, what is God doing? I believe he's demonstrating in the same way he did to Pharaoh. In our generation, the uselessness and helplessness of all these gods. All because man has now entered back upon the throne. Man has enthroned himself and deified himself. And so, O oh sovereign man... Oh, sovereign man, how are you doing today? Well, let me see. Let me see. Crime is still on the increase. Our prison cells are at maximum. In the United States, there's no more room. Abortion is rising. Teenage pregnancy is rising because abortion is rising. How are we doing, sovereign man? Drugs, 183% increase in cocaine just in the last few years. From 15 years ago. How are we doing, O oh sovereign man? Teenage suicide rising. How are we doing, O oh sovereign man? We continue to build our towers towards Babel, making ourselves gods. But we're dying. Our world is getting worse and worse. Men's hearts are getting colder and colder. Deception is running rampant, deeper and deeper. You see, the point is, my friends, man's problems are not physical. They are spiritual. You see, Jesus, now watch this now. Jesus, this, I think this is profound. If you want to write this down, go right ahead. But I, I like this. Now watch this. See, Jesus didn't come to make bad men good. There's, there's something. He didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. That's the difference. Jesus isn't just a moral teacher. If that's all you want, go listen to Confucius and do some Buddha teaching. Go right ahead. That's not what Jesus came to do. He came to take you and me that were dead in our sins and bring life where there's no life. There's a huge difference with that. You see, I may have had a lot of life before I was a Christian, but I was dead. But now I have life. I can really dance unto the Lord. I can really sing. I can really worship because he has changed my life and has put a new song in my heart. Some of us need a new song in our hearts today. And so the Bible says that God softened his heart, but then he hardened it again. Because Pharaoh was bent on using God's people as slaves for his own purposes, and his heart was very, very hard. 
And so I want you to notice the four suggestions or advice that the devil through Pharaoh gave Moses who represents God's people. And these advises, the, listen, these suggestions, I was reading them, I got like a revelation word. These four suggestions still apply today in your life and my life. So as Pharaoh was saying this to Moses, the Pharaoh of this world is still saying this to you and me. So you need to listen very carefully. I need to listen very carefully. Because he's very subtle. The first suggestion that Pharaoh makes to keep Israel in bondage is found in Exodus 8.25. They're all principles that begin with R. I normally teach on Wednesdays. I'll give you a little brief teaching this morning. But watch principle number one. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron. And he said, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Remember what I said. Every word in the Bible is inspired for purpose. Notice sacrifice in the land. What does that mean? Pharaoh's saying, all right, Moses, you want to go and worship and sacrifice to the Lord? Go ahead. But, 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 but Moses, I want you to sacrifice right here in Egypt. Oh my gosh. In other words, Moses, it's all right to have some religion. Oh, here we go now. To have maybe a few superficial changes. It's all right to have religion. As long as it doesn't change your life and get out of Egypt. Oh my gosh. As long as you don't change. You can have all the religion you want as long as you just don't change. It's all right. Don't change your lifestyle. Stay right here in the land of bondage. Continue to be a slave. How many Christians are saved, watch this now, but still enslaved? They're saved, but they're still in bondage to unforgiveness or bitterness. Still in bondage to sexual lust. They, they're saved, but, but they're still enslaved with some Egyptian bondage. It's all right to worship and go to church as long as it doesn't change your life. How many people come to church Sunday after Sunday, but they're not changed? They go back the exact same way, still holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness. And, and this is not how God wants it to be in my life, nor in your life. That's what Pharaoh wants. He's telling Moses, go ahead. You want to worship God? You want to have church? Go ahead, but have it here in Egypt. Just as long as your religion doesn't change the way you talk, the way you walk, just as long as your religion doesn't change your lifestyle, I don't mind. You see, friends, the devil doesn't care if you have religion as long as you stay exactly the same way you are. The religion that leaves you exactly the way you were before. And that's why Jesus spoke to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 23. And he said to them something pretty harsh. But, you know, it'd be kind of tough to say that today. But Jesus didn't mince his words. He said, you Pharisees, you're a bunch of hypocrites. And he said, you err, E-R-R. -R. You're wrong. He says, you don't have the word of God nor the power of God in your lives. And they thought they were great spiritual authority. They thought they were on the cutting edge of spirituality. And they didn't even know God. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? To think that you might be on the cutting edge of spirituality and, and Jesus calls you what? And, you're, and, you, and you don't even know the word of God nor the power of God. That's what he told the Pharisees. That's why they were so upset with Jesus. Well, Pharaoh was saying the same thing to Moses. You can have religion, but just... As long as you don't know the power of God, as long as you don't know God, you just stay right where you're at. And so Moses says, no way, the deal's off. No, let's make a deal. I know it's great on TV. And I know that we like making deals. And uh, door number one or number two or number three, I understand all that. But the deal's off, Moses says. No, 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 no. We're going to serve God all the way. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The deal is off, Pharaoh. I'm not just going to have religion. I got to go deeper. Secondly, number two. My second R. So Pharaoh makes a second suggestion. Exodus 8, 28. He says, all right, Moses. You want to worship your God? Okay, you can leave Egypt, but don't go too far away. 
go, to, you, you can leave, but just, just go a little bit outside of the, not too far away. Oh, I love this one. What does this mean? Moses, you want to serve God? Good. Serve God, but don't be too radical. Don't be too extreme. Uh, don't let this really affect your life. Don't be too outspoken. Don't get too excited about Jesus. Don't get too emotional about Jesus. You get emotional about sports. Get emotional about fun and games and going to Wonderland and, and having all this great watching television movies. Get all fun. Get all excited about that. But don't get excited about Jesus. Don't get excited about the Lord. Don't go too far. Don't get too, too radical in the things of God. Just Keep a lid on it, Moses. Just keep it nice and conservative. Just make sure every T is crossed and every I is dot. Because after all, we, w what will happen if you take this too far? What will people think? How many Christians are there week after week who are nightly tucked in that box and that's all they know, but they never get outside of that boat and never experience the power of God? No risk. No reward spiritually. If you're comfortable in the boat, saint of God, that's where you'll be the rest of your life. Oh, you're a wonderful person. I'm not saying you're wonderful, but, but you'll never experience the deeper things of God. Stay a little bit too far. That's okay, but not too far, Moses. Pharaoh was implying borderline Christianity. Borderline. Mediocrity. It's all right to have a few superficial changes, Pharaoh says. Clean up your act a little bit. Stop smoking, maybe. Stop drinking. A few obvious sins, but no complete transformation. No true surrender to God. Oh, yeah, you don't smoke, and that's good. All right, congratulations. God bless you. You don't drink, wonderful. I'm with you on this one. But Christianity isn't about not smoking or not drinking, my friends. Can I be straight with you? There are a lot of people in the world who do not smoke and who do not drink. Doesn't make them Christians. Some of you are listening to me and you're saying, Pastor Dean, you're, you're getting a little bit too... Uh... Look, all I want to suggest this morning is that when Pharaoh spoke to Moses... He's saying the very thing today that many of us are listening to and we're not really even aware of it because that voice has become so subtle and it's permeating, I believe, this world in which we live in in maybe a greater way than years before. Did not the Bible tell us in Revelation 3 that there's going to be a time and there was a time that we might have an appearance of being alive but we're dead? We have a reputation of being alive. How many churches have a reputation of being alive but really it's not really alive? And my concern is that the Lord would do great things, not on the outside, but within our hearts, that truly the life of God will go deep into our hearts and that we will have true life, true life, not things that just look good on the outside or just superficial changes. You see, there's a lot of people that want enough religion to take them to heaven, but do not want it to cost them anything. As long as my religion doesn't cost me anything, as long as I don't have to give much of my time or my money or, or my life, as long as I can get by. But I'm reminded of what David said, and I believe it's 2 Samuel, I believe it's the 24th chapter. He said, I will not serve of the Lord or sacrifice of the Lord of that which costs me nothing. David says, I'm not going to serve God, you know, uh, for free. In other words, a salvation's free, but discipleship will cost you everything. Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. You want to be a Christian? That's just something. We don't hear that much today. I'm telling you, if Jesus was preaching today, most of the church would leave. Why? You want to be my disciple, he said? You got to eat of my body and drink of my blood? You got to deny yourself? He said, path is narrow. It's not broad. It's narrow. We're trying to have a Christianity. It's broad and narrow at the same time. It doesn't work. And so, yeah. 
And so Moses says, no way. There's no way. I'm, I'm, the deal is off, Pharaoh. There's no way I, I, I'm going to serve the Lord like this. We're going to sacrifice. And so Pharaoh seems to be losing the battle. So he brings another plea, another suggestion. It's found in Exodus 10, verses 8 to 10. Pharaoh says, all right, Moses, you can go wherever you want to go, but leave your children behind. Excuse me? Yeah, leave your children. What is Pharaoh saying by this? He's saying, Moses, you can keep your faith and your religion in church, but, but don't bring it home. You can keep your religion here in church on Sunday morning. 11, 11 o'clock is the, is the most religious time in the, in the week. You can keep your religion in church, but don't bring that message at home. Don't teach your children about the things of God. Don't, don't, don't uh, read the, the scriptures to them. Don't pray with them. Don't take that religious stuff and bring it home. Let your kids grow up. Let them make their minds if they're going to serve God. You don't keep it at home. Don't bring it home. Leave your children behind, Pharaoh says. Let me take care of them. Excuse me? Leave my children behind? Huh? Can't, can't do that. Eh? Pharaoh's saying, don't insist that you have a, a godly marriage that your children could follow after. Your family be Dedicated to God. Oh, insist that your children learn about hygiene. That's good. Or about science. That's good too, I know. Computers. I know that's good. Technology and music and sports. Make sure they know all about that. But don't insist that they know the word of God. Don't insist and bring them to church because you, you don't want the kids to rebel now, do you? Don't insist that they go to Sunday school every Sunday or read the word of God or prayer or have family altar. My third R is refrain from bringing it home. Now sometimes your children will rebel. I understand that parents. But you still have to do the best you can to bring the word home. Yeah. Have religion. Don't be radical. Refrain from bringing your true faith home, Moses. Leave your children to me. Leave them here. Let them make up their own minds. When they're 15 and 16, let them, let them make up their own minds. But my friends, if, watch this now. If you leave it up to them to make up their own minds, they might not ever want to come to the Lord. Why? Is the devil leaving it up to your children? When it comes to booze and drugs and sex and immorality? Absolutely not. Our children are being bombarded constantly about all these things. So the devil isn't leaving it up to our children about all these things and these de de debaucheries that I hear of today. It's getting worse and worse. Some stories that my, my kids are telling me. The devil is not leaving it up to our children to make up their minds about God no, 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 no. He's throwing everything at them to pollute them, to destroy them, to blind them, to deceive them. Teenage pregnancies on the rise. Suicide on the rise. No, he's not leaving it up to them at all. The world and the devil are doing their very best influencing our children from their youth. That's right, early, early, polluting their minds. Early, early. That's why the Bible says to train up a child in the way he shall go and gets older he shall not depart. The word train is a Hebrew word. It means ointment. Watch this now. The word to train, very important parents. It, of course, it means of a discipline. But the root word in the Hebrew is the word ointment. Back in the day when a child couldn't suckle, the mother would give an ointment that will induce suckling. The word train literally means an ointment that induces suckling. We are to train our children. And when they get older, older, that ointment that we placed on their lips spiritually, hopefully we believe that they will not forget and they will come back to that ointment, to that sweet taste that they learned. Train up a child. Put spiritual ointment Induce the suckling. Induce an atmosphere of spiritual growth. Socrates, the, great, the Greek philosopher said, 
when he was on top of a mountain with his disciples, friends, why do you turn every stone to find wealth and neglect your children? In the process, when one day you will have to give it to them anyway. Listen, friends, if you don't teach your children, somebody else will. If you don't teach your children, somebody else will. If you don't teach your children, somebody else will. Insist that somehow, by God's grace, you instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Pharaoh was saying, leave your children behind, Pharaoh. Let me teach them. Let me take care of them. And finally, the last plea before we take communion. Listen carefully. Pharaoh sees that he's losing the battle even more. And he gives his final plea. Exodus 10, 24. Pharaoh says, all right, Moses. You haven't listened to me. You haven't taken my advice yet, Moses. You can go where you want to go, Moses, but let your flocks and your herds stay behind. What does that mean? I want you to renounce. There's my last R. I want you to stop taking the things of God and deal with it in your business matters. I want you to uh, just relax, Moses, with your business interests. This means the place of employment. You see, the devil will attempt everything he can for you to compromise at work. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, compromise your integrity, your taxes, your values, everything, just to fit in at work. After all, haven't you heard? Well, you know, God's principles apply, but they don't apply in business. Have you ever heard that? I got a Greek word for you. Hogwash. Don't tell me you can't live the godly life, the Christian life at work. Don't ever let the devil tell you I can't do this because everybody else does it. If you know, all, all businesses cheat a little bit there, Pastor. And all, all salesmen have to, and all, we all have to kind of, you know, do a little bit of this. And That's not true. I still believe in the integrity of God's work. Whether you're in church, or whether you're home, or whether you're at work. Give me your flocks, Moses. Give me your herds. Give me your business interests. Give me your money. It's all right. Let the devil take care of that. Let him, let him teach you how to run your business. Well, God still believes in honesty and integrity. David said, whoever puts his confidence in God shall never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. I'm going to close with this story. In Buffalo, there was an article written, and this was a Christian man who was writing, this was many years ago, I believe it was 20 years ago, an article from Buffalo, and they were looking for an honest mechanic. Sorry, sweetheart, your glass is here. Hello? Hello? Okay. No, maybe it's for me. I don't know. Looking for an honest mechanic. Has anybody ever looked for an honest mechanic before in your life? <laughs> Haven't found one yet? Well, I'm going to introduce you to somebody very soon. So they were looking for an honest mechanic, and there was an article in the newspaper in Buffalo. And they were looking, and they couldn't find any. And so they decided to go to Toronto. True story. And so there they are, and all they did in their car was just have a loose wire. That's all the problem was, a loose wire that couldn't start the car. That was it. So they brought them to several mechanics. And uh, some, you know, uh, said, well, yeah, oh, thank you, no problem. Yeah, it's going to cost you $485. Oh, well, what's the problem? Oh, well, we got this problem. Now. Okay, next. Oh, it will cost you $1,000 to fix this because, you know, you okay, okay. But there was this one Christian man whose business wasn't going very well. In fact, he was struggling so much, he wasn't even sure if he could even pay his bills at this point. But he always believed in the integrity of God's word. This man who had the car that was doing the survey didn't know that he was a Christian, brings us car, leaves it there. How much will it cost me, sir? Oh, uh, 
cost you nothing. Nothing. What? It cost you nothing. What do you mean? Yeah, it cost you nothing. Well, what's the problem? It was just a loose wire, sir. It's okay. You can go. Loose wire. Look how God operates. The man who was writing the report was so moved by this honest man. When he went back to Buffalo, he wrote a report upon him. And he became so well known in Buffalo that people started going to his garage from Buffalo just to have their cars fixed. And the man almost became a millionaire within a year. <laughs> It pays to be honest. Makita, can you come forward, please? The priest team.